Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Schechtman. Someone once said of actors that the good ones had their emotions much closer to the surface than the rest of us in order to make them more easily accessible. If this is true, that it might be said that for some comedians, their emotions are not just close to the surface, but raw and fully exposed. In the case of Robin Williams, this certainly seems to be true. With Williams, you always had the feeling that the more he exposed about the human condition, the more he made us see it and laugh about it, the more it took him into deeper and darker places in order to find it. With comedians, it's often a question as to whether they're simply reflective of the culture and the times they work in, or in some ways, perhaps like Lenny Bruce, help shape that very culture. Perhaps with Williams, the jury is still out. We're going to talk about that today with my guest, Dave Itzkoff. He is the culture reporter at the New York Times, where he writes regularly about film, television, theater, music, and popular culture. He's been on this program previously to talk about his book, Mad as Hell, about the making of the film network. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dave Itzkoff back to this program to talk about his new biography of Robin Williams, simply titled Robin. Dave Itzkoff, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me back. Great to have you here. If you looked at Robin Williams' work, if you just kind of watched it chronologically from the very beginning to to his most recent work before he died, how much would you understand about Robin Williams? Yeah, I, th- I think you could you could infer a certain amount. I, I think you you might you might guess or speculate what was happening in his life, sort of uh, you know consequ concurrently with the roles that he was playing. And I think oftentimes he did choose parts or characters that uh, in some way had something to do with what was happening in in his own life at the time or that spoke to him in a, a certain moment of, of his life. Uh, you might be able to, to, to make some pretty uh, educated guesses, although I think uh, people will be even better served when they really do know what was happening in, in his world and, and how it informed uh, the work that he was doing. Right. One of the remarkable things, it seems, about him was that there were these periods, and you write about several of them, these periods of self-reflection that he had, and that sometimes the more self-reflective he got, the, the deeper he got into himself, that it kind of scared him and really pushed him into dangerous places. Yeah, I think that you could make that that argument, and I, I mean, he, I think he was perpetually uh, conscious of sort of, you know, where where he felt he stood in his own industry, whether as a comedian, you know, am I the most popular? Are there people that are more popular than me? And likewise with his. Uh, you know, film career. And, you know, again, you know, it, it, am I doing a role right now that people like as much as other roles that I have done? Am I, are my movies making a lot of money or are they starting to tail off? And uh, it's good uh, to a certain extent, I think, for a person to be uh, cognizant and, and, and to, to be invested in their own work and career that way. But I think uh, he was, you know, especially uh focused on it at times and it was also a source of i think a lot of uh anxiety for him and a lot of kind of self-flagellation that perhaps uh he did not need to put himself through how did he distinguish between his stand-up work and his film work how did he approach them either the same or differently well i think in a way he kind of gets uh dismissed sometimes as a, a comedian who one day woke up and decided that he wanted to be taken seriously and then started pursuing serious roles. And it, it was not that way at all, that he actually uh, trained as, you know, as a serious actor and had a very kind of classical background in uh, theater, that he had attended uh, two different colleges where uh, you know, he focused very closely on acting and did a lot of stage performance and then studied at uh, Juilliard for three years at uh, their drama school. And it was only after dropping out of Juilliard and, and coming back to uh, the Bay Area in the mid-70s that he kind of fell into 
a stand-up scene that was having a resurgence and, and found that he had uh, an aptitude for it. So, uh, it, you know, he always was pursuing both of those tracks, the comedy and the acting, simultaneously. And uh, the comedy kind of hit a little bit before the uh, acting career took off, and that kind of got him put in a box as a, a comedian when he was, of course, so much more. It's interesting about the acting career that that even something like winning Academy Awards was very important to him. Well, I think that he always, ha- I mean, he's, his interest in, in acting, I think, was certainly uh, sincere. And, and winning the Oscar, uh, you know, it, particularly in, the, in the, the generation and the era that he grew up in, it was, uh, you know, about as validating an honor as, as one could imagine as an actor and put him you know, in the same sort of class as uh, all of his, uh, you know, his heroes and, uh, you know, I mean, literally the night that, that he won, uh, you know, in the Oscars show, they did this segment where, uh, you know, they had about as many surviving Oscar winners as they could gather to be in this kind of live portrait that they took. And he was literally standing next to uh, Shirley Temple Black. So to feel like you're part of that uh, you know, Hollywood tradition and, and, and that legacy was, uh, you know, very, very important to him. Talk about that, the way in which success was important to him. You know, you, you talk to, to some actors or comedians, and they will tell you endlessly about the work is really what's important. And that, you know, and sometimes they meet it and sometimes they don't when they talk about success and fame not being as important. For Williams, it was pretty important. Well, I think it, it it was something that perhaps uh, you know he tried to mask a little bit. I mean, he it was I think at heart a very uh, modest person and and somebody who was never you know fully convinced that he possessed the talents that uh, other people saw in him, or even once he achieved the fame that he had, that he was uh, worthy or deserving of that. But then in in other moments. Uh, you know, for example, Pam Dauber, who worked very closely with him, of course, on, on Mork and Mindy, uh, you know, talks about, you know, the period when that show was, was starting to take off and, 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 you know, feeling like Robin really kind of saw it as like this is something that he was meant to do and meant to have, that he was really uh, kind of, uh, you know, embracing it and, and ready for the show to take off in the way that it did. In many ways... His work seems, at least, maybe it's just in retrospect, seems so reflective of the times that he was in. Well, I think that, you know, he kind of, you know, broke into comedy at a time, uh, stand-up certainly when, you know, it was undergoing a pretty major kind of revolution that it was, you know, not, it didn't have to be a place anymore just for these kind of uh, you know, straightforward monologues that were delivered in a kind of uh, linear fashion and that he helped pioneer something that was much more uh, discursive and and much more uh, off the cuff and spontaneous, which was a style that uh, certainly uh, suited him. So, you know, he got to be the kind of uh, benchmark for, uh, you know, for that that type of material. Also, uh, certainly in the late seventies and early eighties, uh, I mean, there were a lot, there were a lot of people were doing bits, uh, you know, about drugs, about, uh, you know, bad behavior with, uh, controlled substances. And, and that was, you know, also often a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, 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 a part of uh, his routine, or that was a, a subculture that he seemed to be uh, attuned to or tapping into, uh, you know, even before, you know, he finally sort of owned up to his own uh, drug abuse some years later. Talk a little bit about his alcohol and drug abuse and how it got started and, and, and really what were the periods of time where he really tried to, to get it under control? Certainly by the time he came to uh, Los Angeles and, and was really finding, uh, success in the, in the clubs and, and even, you know, even before breaking in with, uh, Happy Days and, and Mork and Mindy. I mean, that, that kind of behavior was pretty well ingrained in him. And that also, uh, you know, probably had its origins in, uh, you know, his performances at a lot of the San Francisco clubs, which were, uh, pretty rowdy and, you know, a lot of, uh, alcohol got served in those places. And so, you know, the performing at a bunch of clubs in a given night and just, you know, drinking and carousing at, at all those places and then heading out to parties afterwards, that kind of became uh, the the pattern of behavior that became the lifestyle for him. And then, 
uh, I mean, I'm sure people will recall this, that, you know, he was, uh, you know, in, in the company of John Belushi the night uh, before Belushi died of his overdose. And that event combined with uh, the birth of Robin's first son a few months later, those two sort of, uh, you know, uh, monolithic moments really uh, compelled him to get clean, to kick both his drinking and drug habits uh, cold turkey. And he was able to do that successfully for about uh, 20 years and then, uh, you know, had a relapse into alcoholism in the early 2000s. And at that time really came to understand that, you know, he had not fully dealt with, uh, you know, the, a lot of the issues that were underlying his addictions uh, all those years ago. Talk a little bit about who his heroes were. Well, I mean, there's no question that his idol was Jonathan Winters, uh, somebody that he had seen perform a number of times uh, on, you know, late night television of that era, particularly on the uh, when Jack Parr was host of The Tonight Show and then when Parr had his own uh, show after that, that, uh, you know, Winters was uh, kind of, a, a, you know, deceptively buttoned down and would, you know, come on these shows in the sort of traditional suit and tie, but do these very uh, spontaneous kinds of routines. He had one-liners, but then also he could just be handed a, a simple prop like a stick and then just come up with, you know, character after character using the stick as a kind of different prompt in in each bit. That was really the uh the the man that he was probably most trying to emulate and who most uh you know inspired him to do what he did. A big portion of the book is really devoted to his personal life, to his three marriages and to all the turbulence that was part of his personal life. Give us a little overview of that. Well, his first wife, Valerie, who was the mother of his first son, Zach, uh, she uh, met him. They got together really right as his uh, comedy career was starting to happen in San Francisco. And so, you know, she comes with him to L.A. where everything just uh, blows up, where his comedy career uh, you know, skyrockets and where he gets cast in Mork and Mindy. And so at that point, Robin is really, you know, on the, uh, a rocket ride to stardom. And, and uh, Valerie certainly felt like she didn't get to come along on that ride, uh, that, that, you know, in the sort of social scene of, of that city, that people were way more interested in Robin as the famous one and viewed her as more of a kind of a, an obstacle or an impediment that was very hard on the marriage. And certainly he was unfaithful to her that you know he uh, just was able to meet a lot of women uh, through you know parties and and uh, certainly indulged in that and and she was aware of it uh, uh, his second wife Marsha uh, you know started out first as a kind of a, a nanny to uh, his son Zach and then became Robin's assistant for a time they didn't get together until after you know Robin's uh, first marriage was you know pretty much over uh, and and uh, Marsha became extremely integral to Robin's life and career, not just sort of helping to manage his day-to-day -day life, but really had a lot of uh, influence over material that he chose in his work. And, you know, she helped him get movies like Mrs. Doubtfire. She helped find that book and uh, develop it into the movie, and it became, uh, to that point, really the biggest hit he'd ever had. Uh, but even their marriage uh, foundered after Robin had his relapse and, uh, you know, that really was, uh, you know, a, a stain on the, the family they felt. I think it was a great embarrassment to, uh, to, to Robin. Uh, and then uh, he met his uh, third wife, now his widow, uh, Susan, some years after, uh, you know, he and Marsha uh, divorced. There was a period that he went through when he and Marsha divorced where it seemed that everything was going bad. He was back into alcohol and drugs. He had uh, open heart surgery. Talk, talk a little bit about that period, the impact that it had on him. Well, I mean, the 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 relapse and the rehab happened before his divorce, but you know, then the divorce obviously was very uh, difficult on him. I mean, that was just a huge heartbreak for him and the family. And then uh, one of the ways that I think he sort of sought to get, you know, just get past that emotionally was to uh, start this comedy tour that he ended up calling Weapons of Self Destruction. Uh, but in his first attempt to do it, that's when they went on the road and he started having all the heart problems and breathing problems. And they discovered that he had, uh, you know, a broken heart valve and he had to undergo 
surgery for that and then recover from that before he could even uh, resume the tour. So those were all, uh, you know, really tough experiences for him to, uh, you know, to have to endure in uh, the span of, uh, you know, two or three years. But I, if people go back and watch uh, that set, that well, Weapons of Self-Destruction show, I mean, I think it's, it's about as close as Robin ever came to really, you know, being fully confessional in, in his routine. It's still holding back some, but it's really, you know, I think him trying to tell you as much as, as he can about the truth of his life and what he's been going through. And, and to what extent was that always true in his work, that, it's, that the work itself, particularly his stand-up, reflected who he was at any given time? I think that that was something that he, he had to learn how to be comfortable with. I think if you go all the way back to the beginning and the you know those periods in the late seventies when he was just starting to catch fire, uh, there's almost nothing personal about those routines. They're really all uh, character bits, and and you almost never even hear him talk in his own voice. If you were just a, a person in the audience who'd never seen him before, you, you, if you only watched those routines, you'd have almost no sense of you know who Rob, the real Robin Williams is, or what he sounds like. Uh, little by little, I think certainly by the time you get to uh, a show like Live at the Met, which is in 86. And then he starts talking about uh, you know, his, some of his own experiences with drug and alcohol. Certainly he talks about the experience of becoming a father and raising Zach as a very young child. And those are, of course, coming right out of firsthand experience. Uh, but I think it, 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 it really took him years, if not decades, to finally uh, reveal himself as, as fully as he could uh, allow him to do uh, in his stand-up. And was that painful for him to, to put that out there? I think so. I think that in some ways the stand-up and certainly the, the speed of it and the energy of it was more about uh, kind of keeping people at a distance. Uh, I mean, a lot of different important people in his life, whether it's uh, Valerie or, or uh, Pam Dauber, they've all told me stories in the book about how in – their first encounters with Robin, when he would be introduced to them for the first time, he would often put on a character. He would introduce himself to Valerie as a French man or introduce himself to Pam as a, a Russian man and speak in an accent. And it was partly to just make the other person laugh and entertain them. But also, I think he is genuinely trying to conceal something about himself. He's a little bit afraid of putting the authentic Robin in front of people because he's afraid that what if what if they don't like me? What if they reject me? And so in a way, it's easier to kind of go out as a persona and protect the real person at the core of that. Was there ever a period where he felt really confident? I think there were times, there were moments. I think he had a pretty uh, extraordinary run from, let's say, the mid to late 80s into the early 1990s when you go from Good Morning Vietnam to Dead Poets Society to The Fisher King uh, and Awakenings. Uh, of those films, I mean, the only one he didn't get an, an Oscar nomination for was Awakenings, and that uh, wounded him a little bit. I think he, he almost sort of felt like he deserved uh, an Oscar nomination for that one as well. And, you know, when you start feeling that way about yourself, I think I think there's a certain amount of uh, confidence and bravado underlying that. But he also had very long periods where he didn't feel confident about himself. And even, you know, even after he won his Oscar, I mean, he got to enjoy that for a little bit. And then I think had, you know, many years after of, uh, you know, feeling like his time as a leading man was perhaps expired and then trying to figure out, well, where, where do I go from there? What kind of work, what kind of roles should I be doing if, if that's true? Tell us a little bit about his work ethic, because one of the things we think about with, with Williams is a certain degree of spontaneity to so much of what he did, but a lot of it was really planned and, and really thought through. Absolutely. I think if you if you look at a film like Good Morning Vietnam and those uh, DJ routines that he's performing as the uh, 
Adrian Cronauer character, and you watch them, and it, it does really seem like he is uh, coming up with those bits, uh, you know, in real time as the camera is rolling. And in fact, you know, in that role and in, in, in several others like it, uh, there was a lot of preparation that he did in advance. Uh, again, on, on Good Morning Vietnam, I mean, he did a lot of uh, research even before going to Thailand to make the film, just learning about the history of that era, the pop culture, the news of that time. You know, what would military personnel be hearing about on the radio in that moment? And then, you know, Robin taking the time to just whip up a bunch of jokes and, and basically perform them, uh, you know, for Marsha, who is his, his assistant at the time, just kind of riffing off the top of his head and, and the two of them just writing everything down and then trying to organize that into sort of coherent routines so that by the time he does go in front of the camera, he's got, you know, dozens if not hundreds of uh, these jokes in his back pocket. And the real genius, I think, as much as it was about coming up with things in the moment, it was preparing himself so that he could look spontaneous. That was a real talent, too. Right. He made it look so easy. Yeah, and oftentimes he is, especially if you look at his uh, stand-up and the stand-up where he is interacting with his audience. I mean, a lot of times he is coming up with those things in the moment, and it, it's just it's fascinating to watch. It's uh, you know, it, it reminds us. I mean, our our minds are working at a level. It, it just it, we laugh at things and we know they're funny, and then it takes us a minute to kind of understand well, why did I find that funny and to piece that together. But our our minds understand that almost before we realize that. Who were his friends? Who was he close to besides his his wives? Well, certainly he was very close to Billy Crystal, who they actually had the same managers throughout their careers, and they met each other, worked with each other, or, or performed with each other for the first time in the late 70s, but didn't really become friends until probably the early uh, 80s. And, and, you know, Billy was there, uh, you know, all throughout Robin's uh, career. Uh, and, you know, he, I mean, he was certainly... Uh, you know, friendly with a lot of other comedians like Bobcat Goldthwait, people who maybe didn't uh, achieve quite the same level of, uh, you know, fame or recognition that, that Robin uh, did. Uh, Eric Idle, uh, you know, one of the members of Monty Python became a friend uh, right around the time that he made uh, Popeye and, and, you know, was a very uh, good friend and an important influence on him. Talk a little bit about his work with directors because it was really the the one time he came across people that also had equally strong views that he had to push up against yeah it was something that he definitely had to learn uh you know particularly as he started doing more movie work i mean if you look at you know the the first couple of uh you know, features that he starred in out of the gate. I mean, he's making Popeye with Robert Altman and then The World According to Garp with George Roy Hill. And both of those guys are pretty, you know, veteran filmmakers and they're real uh, no-nonsense uh, guys. And, you know, Robin's coming into those situations with the success of Mork and Mindy where he's allowed to do a lot of improvisation or at least, you know, allowed to shape material uh, to his own uh, benefit and in both of the cases of the films, you know, I mean, there are scripts that are written and that the directors expect them to perform as written. And so, you know, he, he certainly butted heads with Altman on his dialogue for Popeye and with George Roy Hill on Garp. I mean, in those first few days, if Robin tried to improvise at all, uh, you know, Hill would just call cut for the day. And it really had to teach Robin the lesson that it was not his set it belonged to the director and that he had to uh you know earn the right to uh to improvise and how did he adapt to that well in some cases it was the the filmmakers adapting to him i mean it was uh, mm. uh, uh kind of a license that uh, robin fought for on just about every film the right to you know kind of riff in in character and sometimes you know when it was when it were when he's working with directors that were more amenable to him and certainly by the time you get to uh you know barry levinson on good morning vietnam people kind of understood the best way to get a performance out of robin is you know let him do a couple of takes as written then let him do a couple of takes where he can uh, just kind of run wild and free and do what he wants then maybe try to find some middle ground in subsequent takes and then you go back into the editing room and you see what worked best but that kind of compromise uh, you know i think i think later in his career and the better directors the ones who really knew how to get 
the best work out of him, understood that that was the way to do it. To him, which was more important, the stand-up work or the film work? You know, it's an interesting question because I, I think I think they went hand in hand in in some way. I mean, certainly, you know, acting was his first love, and that's what got him uh, into all of it. And he certainly wanted to be perceived as uh, a talented and and successful actor. But the the stand up, uh, you know, mattered a great deal to him also. I and you know, I think he he did it. He certainly did the stand up with. Uh, you know, less and less frequency later in in his career. There's a, there are sort of you know large gaps between, let's say, uh, you know, uh, you know the Robin Williams live uh, set from 2002 to then Weapons of Self Destruction in you know 2008, 2009. It was something that, that became something he could only do. You know, when he had a lot of downtime, when there wasn't a great uh, you know acting role available for him. And give us a sense of, of really the, his last year, what led up to his death in August of 2014. Yeah, I mean, the the last sort of major role that, that he did uh, was, uh, you know, re- returning as uh, Teddy, uh, Teddy Roosevelt in uh, the Third Night at the Museum movie uh, that he shot in, uh, you know, sort of mid-2013. Uh, and, and even by then... Uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, the health problems that he were, he was having, uh, you know, were really, uh, you know, starting to, to manifest that, uh, you know, on, on that set, uh, you know, he was starting to feel like he was having memory problems and, and not able to, uh, remember his lines and, uh, you know, his, his makeup artist, you know, just tried to encourage him and said, you know, why don't you go into a comedy club and, do a surprise appearance, and and it really sort of made him uh, sad and upset that he felt, you know, he literally told his makeup artist, you know, I can't, I can't be funny anymore, which is, uh, you know, a devastating thing to uh, to hear from Robin Williams, and uh, you know, just for 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 months, he just had all kinds of, uh, you know, health issues that they weren't able to fully sort of reconcile or understand that it was part of a single disease that was causing all this. I mean, he was having. Uh, you know, motor problems in terms of uh, stature and posture and, you know, walking and that sort of thing. But also, you know, having uh, a lot of anxiety and, and, and sometimes kind of, uh, you know, what people I think later realized was more paranoia. Uh, and, you know, just people would notice that he would just seem to kind of uh, shut down, that he'd be physically present. You could look in his eyes and see that a light was on, but he just wasn't even engaging with uh, with people, and and it was really not until much later that it, people understood these are all uh, likely connected to uh, Lewy body disease. But that was really only discovered after, after he died. I mean, they thought he That's had right. Parkinson's. I mean, there were a lot of theories, but he was never really diagnosed. Well, I mean, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, and that is, uh, you know, neurologists would, would, would say that, I mean, it's not a misdiagnosis to say that he had that, because that certainly does... Uh, you know, at least account for a lot of the the motor problems that he was having. You're right that the the you know the evidence of Louis body was not found until uh, after his death and in, you know in his autopsy, which is you know published uh, several months later. I mean, they're both diseases that you know are not. Uh, I mean, they're progressive. They're not curable. Uh, and uh, you know, e- you know, it, even if he had known exactly uh, what he had, I mean, he, certainly, you know, he could have gotten uh, care and attention, but it was going to be, uh, you know, a, a progressive decline no matter what. How do you think he wants to be remembered? Well, I think he's somebody that uh, it always mattered a great deal to him that. Uh, he be able to give joy to other people. That people, uh, you know, take pleasure from, uh, you know, the stand-up he was performing and the characters that he was playing. And I think he certainly uh, achieved that in in uh, so many of his roles. And and I think they endure. Uh, I think that people of uh, you know all different generations remember him for for different roles at different times. Uh, you know, in in his life, but I just I don't think anybody uh, achieved quite what he did either as a comedian or as an actor, and it's it's hard to imagine that somebody will be able to uh, duplicate uh, what he did. Dave Itzkoff, the book is Robin. Dave, I thank you so much for spending time with us today. It was my pleasure. Thanks for the time today. Thank you. <laughs> and then there are your friends who smoke marijuana, going, God, man, alcohol's a crutch. <laughs> Really, Captain Herbal Life? <laughs> really? God, 
You just macrame your ass into the couch and you're giving me shit. <laughs> Remember when you get so stoned you can actually see a fly in space going, mm. <laughs> And when you get stoned, your discussion goes out the window. You could be eating kitty litter going, mm, this is crunchy, man. <laughs> The horrible thing is people who get stoned try and get their animals stoned to make them feel better. <laughs> it's not bad enough that you proved that Darwin was wrong. You're going to take the whole family with you. <laughs> Here's your dog going, please don't do this to me. I've just learned to lick my own genitals. Leave me alone. Don't do this to me. And your dog, you go, hey, Farfel. <laughs> dog, whoa, my tail, my tail. <laughs> don't do it. Don't push him back down the food chain. Don't do that. And don't mess with your cat because he's looking at you like, give it your best shot, man. I've been doing catnip since the day I was goddamn born. Come on, you blow it in his face. He's like, all of a sudden he's Ram Kitty. He looks at you like the first thing I'm going to do, man, is climb you like a goddamn curtain. Then a double dismount. Then 15 times around the house real quick. <laughs> Scare the shit out of the kid. <laughs> then outside by the window making this noise. <laughs> like a baby in a blender. <laughs> and you're inside stone going, oh God, help me now. <laughs> and the next thing is you start to get hungry. You think you can leave the house, you liar. <laughs> you think, I'm going to be fine, man. I've got, I've got to leave the house. I'm going to be okay. If you could just find your goddamn feet, yeah, you'll be okay. <laughs> then you think you can drive. You think, yeah, I'll be okay. I'll drive. I'll drive. I'll be okay. And you have one of those new Japanese cars where you open the door and it goes, your door is open. <laughs> and if you're stoned, you're going, I knew that. <laughs> so you get in the car. You think, yes, I'm now. I've got it. I'm uh, the keys. Okay, fine. The keys, fine. <laughs> Okay, reverse. Fine. Okay. <laughs> then you're going down the freeway. You think you're traveling at light speed. You think Scotty's sitting next to you going, Jim, you can't push it any faster. <laughs> it's just a shovel Jim. Don't drag it over the edge. <laughs> Your hair's blowing in the wind, and the window isn't even open. <laughs> you're that stone. You turn on the radio. You understand everything. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly on the radio, man stoned on freeway. How do they know? How do they know? God damn it. I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. Suddenly in the rear of your mirror, red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue. How patriotic. Yeah. <laughs> Shit, the police. Eat everything in the ashtray. Eat everything in the ashtray. <laughs> oh, God. I'll pull it over. Pull it over. All of a sudden, you start rehearsing. What seems to be the problem, officer? What seems to be the problem, officer? What seems to be the problem? I'm fine. I'm fine. What seems to be the problem? Nice day, officer. What seems to be the problem? Usually, you're stopped by a motorcycle cop. He gets off his bike like... God, am I incredibly well endowed. <laughs> I'll get your door. <clears throat> there you go. <laughs> From inside your car comes this Colombian sauna like... <clears throat> Suddenly he's going, I'm hungry, I don't know why. <laughs> You're looking at him. You've rehearsed your line. What seems to be the problem? What seems to be the problem? You look at him and go... Can we do <laughs> His face turns into a cheeseburger. You lunge! <laughs> Next thing you know, you end up in a cell. Go, please don't hurt me. <laughs> but the truth is, you wake up and you're still on the couch at home. 